Good day to everybody. Welcome to the podcast YouTube channel, Faith Seeking Understanding. I am Alan Bevere. I am a pastor, retired professor. I'm a Bible moth. I am a theologian in exile, and I'm a peddler of hope. And I'm also the self-appointed uh, Anselm of Canterbury, chair of podcast theology and culture here at Faith Seeking Understanding University, a totally made up university, but a place where we all can come and ponder profound things free of charge. And I am so pleased. Uh, we are starting a new program here, and it's going to be called The Wesleyan Way, in which we will talk about all things Wesleyan and Methodist. And my first guest for this premiere episode is Bishop William Williman, and he is um, the professor of the practice of Christian ministry at Duke University Divinity School, and he is a retired bishop of the North Alabama Conference. Uh, Bishop Williman, welcome. Thanks for oh, being here. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I'm kind of guessing that even though you're a retired bishop, bishops don't quite retire, though, do they? I mean, you may not be serving an area. Well, uh, in the Methodist Church, you're, you're bishop for life. Yeah, right. Um, we took that from the Episcopalians. Don't know if it's a necessarily good practice, but it does mean that I'm retired yeah. from bishoping yeah <laughs> and uh uh you know. gotcha i gotcha well you're certainly certainly busy and continue to write uh and we're going to talk today about your latest book here don't look back uh the methodism methodist hope for what comes next thank you i thoroughly enjoyed reading your book and of course your books are always challenging um one of the first questions that I wanted to ask you about this is you you early on in the book, you say that that this book is a result from listening to pastors, just listening, um, not necessarily checking out the latest from Barna or Pew Forum, but just listening to pastors. How many pastors do you think you talked to for this book? I would think a, a fair estimate would be a, a, a two 200, 250. Okay. Um, some of those were individual conversations, and some of those were conversations in small groups online. <clears throat> and so uh, talked to a lot of people. I did also uh, try to listen. I picked out about um, a dozen podcasts mm -hmm. uh, like yours, and that work with on, on church leadership and listen to those like the Ignite podcast that's done by a group of Methodists out of uh, Texas, uh, listen to like uh, 50 episodes of that podcast. Um, and one of the things I say in the book is that there are more resources for church leaders, maybe than in the entire history of the church, including podcasts like yours. Yeah. And so I felt like I've, had the opportunity thereby to get a good barometer of just where Methodists are uh, in the present moment. Yeah, uh, pastors and church leaders. Yeah, how do you? How was that experience? I mean, how, how would you characterize that as different from? You know, you could have got, you could have done polls and research, and which is what and you may have looked at some of that. But how was just being in that conversation and listening? Well, how, you know, you. You learn more. Uh, communication is better if you can do it face to face with yeah. people. And um, <clears throat> I, I had uh, uh, you know six or eight questions that I tried to ask every in every conversation and get responses. Uh, I, of course, you know that's dependent on who who's willing to talk to you, <laughs> and so it wasn't. Uh, completely, you know, random and all, and it made no attempt to be objective, uh, if if there is such a thing. But it, it had the sense of colleagues talking together about uh, areas of common concern, and um, I think and continue to feel now that the book is out, and I'm now that started a dialogue, and I'm hearing from people that uh, I did get. A true sense of, of where people were. What uh, what uh, were 
some common themes that you would say uh, appeared over and over again in that conversation? I think there was a, a, a sense of sadness, uh, a sense of loss, uh, loss uh, from two sources, the pandemic being one, uh, these, these conversations occurred over this past year. So we, uh, um, <clears throat> churches uh, disappointed by how we've come out of the pandemic and uh, many, uh, there's a lot of that. And also the uh, divisiveness within the denomination, separations, uh, sadness uh, about inevitable losses <clears throat> with those two factors. Then it was also a, a sense of, of, of anxiety about that. So that was there. Uh, there also a, a growing sense of, uh, I'd say anger, um, anger at what Methodists were saying about one another, uh, anger that uh, positions were being falsely represented, uh, and uh, some, I know, with some of the lay conversations, uh, there was anger that a lot of this was clergy-driven, uh, <clears throat> a lot of our divisiveness, and um, that, so I think those those were factors uh, that I picked up. Okay. You know, one of the things that you, you do this right at the beginning of the book and you talk about it throughout, and I really appreciated it. You talk about the church being local, going local and, and that how critical that is. I'm, and I've always said that the vitality of a denomination is only as vital as the local churches are vital. It's not the other way around. Amen. Um, one of the things I did in my ministry is every time I was appointed to a church, whether it was, and I've served in various <clears throat> contexts, whether it was a rural church with a cornfield <clears throat> behind it, whether it was suburban, downtown, inner, inner city, I always the first week would walk the neighborhood and just ah, see what's around. Yes, you. Right? Yes. And one thing I discovered is congregations are not in touch with their local neighborhood. Now, again, what has happened in United Methodism that that most of our, not all, but certainly, you know, maybe 80% of our congregations are just not in touch with who's living around them. I, uh, you put your finger on, I think, the challenge for most congregations. One of the thing factors is uh, if you're a Methodist congregation, your um, chances are you're, you're 100 years old. Uh, uh, <laughs> we have a high percentage of, of very old churches. And that means, therefore, that that church is not in the neighborhood it was built for. <laughs> the neighborhood has changed. The church building has been there. And um, they, I, I remember a study done a while back and um, it seemed like <clears throat> this came through Lyle Schaller, uh, a distinguished church Methodist observer, but that uh, you've got, we have a high percentage of congregations where over half of the congregation commutes to that church, uh, 10 miles uh, or sometimes more. Well, that that's a church that's not thriving within its neighborhood. So job one for most of us is to uh, get back into the neighborhood. And I I know uh, one of the things I say in the book is that that the question to be asked your church is not, are we traditionalist? Are we progressive? Do we stay in the nomination? Do we go in the nomination, out of the nomination? The question is, how can we rediscover the portion of Christ's mission that Christ has assigned to us, and then how can we get on board with what Christ is doing in this neighborhood? And so to find your mission within your time and your place, your neighborhood, is the most important task for every congregation. In fact, <clears throat> that's why 
I consider the talk of division, the divisions going on, the voting about that, the discussion, et cetera, et cetera, a huge distraction from the <clears throat> most important task, most congregations. Uh, for a congregation who is a has as its median age 62 years old, and I think the average the median age for Methodism in generally uh, in North America is like 65 years old now. Uh, our problem is not, are we conservative? Are we liberal? Uh, do we wanna go with a new denomination or stay in the old denomination? Our problem is that Methodists are aging out and our median age is invariably an indicator for how we've lost touch with our neighborhood. Uh, you mentioned that when you went to a church, <clears throat> you would walk the neighborhood. Well, bless you. That that's a basic thing to do. I, I had a as a bishop, had a pastor who um, was suffering from depression, and he, uh, but he then reported to me that he had done an amazing turnaround. And he said, I was sitting in my church office one day, and he said, I really think it was under the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I got up, I walked out of the church building and just walked down the sidewalk and started knocking on doors. First door I knocked on, a house that was one house away from our church. And I just simply said to people, hi, I'm a pastor from the church down there and would just like to meet you and know who our neighbors are. He said, the woman said to me, from that church, I thought that church had closed uh, two doors down. And he said, I I just, I meet with people and then I ask them, it, hey, I'm in the business of prayer. Would you like to pray? Is there something I can pray for for you? Anyway, he, but when I talked to him, he'd been engaging in this practice for a couple of weeks. He said, I'm now down uh, two blocks from the church. I now am joined by a lay leader from the church on these walks. And he said, our goal is to claim everything within four blocks of our church as our turf, our what God has assigned to us. And uh, he said, it's amazing. Uh, people are responding, visiting, um, so anyway, that getting in touch with your neighborhood, I know that Methodists swept across North America in the 18th century, one of the most amazing, uh, and in the 19th century, uh, stories of church growth in the history of Christianity. And uh, because we went to where the people were, uh, more traditional denominations stayed in the cities like Philadelphia, Boston, New York, and had beautiful buildings there. Methodists went out uh, in mission uh, across the continent. Uh, there were more Methodist churches than U.S. post offices. And when we settled down and became parochial, <laughs> um, when we stopped going to where people are and instead said to people, you got to come to us, uh, we, well, the results are we are now in a nomination that is aging out of, of being a vital church. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your story reminds me of uh, <clears throat> what you say about a Methodist and mission and going out reminds me about a decade ago. Now I was having dinner with Steve Manscar one night who is now retired, but was the director of the General Board of Discipleship as it used to be. But he said to me over dinner, we were talking, and he, he was telling me he likes to go to these conferences. You know, Adam Hamilton has his, uh, you know, every mm -hmm. year and other churches, uh, and they don't have to be Methodist. He, he just likes to go to these conferences where they talk about the church and mission. And he said, I, I um, you know, I make contact with some of the speakers and they're not and, and a lot of them are not Methodists, actually. And he said, mm -hmm. when they find out I'm Methodist, they say, oh, Wesley wrote the playbook on this. He said, you guys need to get back to what Wesley right. was doing. You've lost it. 
And he tells me that story. He says that doesn't just just happen once or twice. It happens all the time. These these pastors and these church leaders who who have experienced growth and vitality in their ministries all credit it back to Wesley. What has happened? There, you, you know, uh, you're in your series now uh, on Wesleyanism, and uh, Wesley, it, it's all mission, <laughs> and the current uh, United Methodist appointive system uh, that we have is is a missionally driven uh, uh, polity and it where pastors are subordinated <laughs> to the mission of Jesus Christ in each local church at our best pastors are still appointed on the basis of an assessment of that church's local mission <clears throat> and are put there to lead that mission. At its worst, <laughs> it just becomes a kind of circular, uh, go to here, go to there, uh, without regard to the mission of the church or in a sense uh, to churches that have, have no mission other than the care, feeding, consolation, comfort of, of their current membership. Yeah. And um, well, we're we're paying for that. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's a it's a beautiful system. Uh, those moments, those holy moments, when a bishop can say to a pastor, uh, in effect, "Let's see, you felt God wanted you to give your life to the uh, mission of the church." Well, we've got a, a situation now uh, with the church that says. They don't want to die. They want to get back in touch with their neighborhood. Uh, it's it's going to be tough, but we've decided you're just the one to lead that for the following reasons. And uh, that's that's so deeply Wesleyan. Yeah. And uh, Francis Asbury, the first our first bishop, <clears throat> um, really. Uh, he elevated itineracy, the, the practice of moving frequently, uh, to a huge theological principle and thought the worst thing that could ever happen to a Methodist preacher was to locate, uh, to settle down, settle in to that particular location. No, your job is to keep moving in order to keep the church in motion. Yeah. And that... Uh, that Methodist vision is is beautiful. And as you say, uh, sometimes other churches now embody that much better than we. And uh, that that's sad. Yeah. Um, connected to, with that, talk large for a minute in reference <clears throat> to uh, the, the conferences. You write uh, in your book on page 130, it's vital for a congregation to focus on mission but when bishops don't honor a congregation's mission in clergy appointments, it's deadly. So here's here's my question. And I whenever I ask this question of anybody, I always preface it by saying I've never been on a cabinet. Right. I've never been a superintendent, never been. You know, I, so I don't I don't know the challenges <clears throat> that a bishop in a cabinet face an appointment. So I with that caveat, I ask this question. You know. What you, we, we know, we know from research that a pastor's most effective years at a congregation is between years four and 12, give or take. If Pastor Sarah is in year seven and the spirit is still moving in, in, with this mission and the church is doing great things in mission, why should we reappoint Pastor Sarah at that point? In other words, in other words, I, I, some of the things I've heard over the years is that someone will say, a superintendent will say, well, we have to remember that there is a larger church here. Okay, fair enough. But if, again, the local congregation is the key to vitality, is it possible to follow a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it rule in reference to appointments and honor the mission in some cases when, when, it's, when it's needed, longer appointments? Uh, absolutely. I think the test is not, uh, the questions to be asked by a bishop and cabinet are not 
the questions that are often asked, like, let's see, what's the salary at that church for the pastor? Or how long has that pastor been there? Or how short a time has that pastor been there? Or um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, how long has this pastor been in ministry? Uh, it, and, uh, those questions are irrelevant. <laughs> Two, the more important question is, what is God doing through that pastor in that congregation now? And for instance, uh, uh, a, a, a relevant question is, gosh, that, that pastor was has been a vital leader at that congregation, but it looks like from the numbers, et cetera, uh, that congregation is plateauing. It looks like the pastor has made a, an important contribution to the mission of that congregation, but that seems to be plateauing. You know, I I know what it's like to be seven years at a place. You've got to have disciplines for staying alive and vital. You, a lot of the goals that you set in the first three or four years uh, are accomplished. Well, you, you've got to uh, get new goals. Uh, the demands on the congregation have changed and all. So there can be great reasons for moving. Uh, again, Asbury felt that if pastors stayed too long in one place, they, and by his definition of too long in one place would be like a month. <laughs> and or But uh, if you stay too long in one place, sometimes a pastor starts to take over ministry that ought to be the late people's ministry, or sometimes the, uh, depending on the pastor's style of leadership, the, the church becomes too dependent on the pastor in the wrong way. And uh, so, and also, um, <clears throat> as somebody who was a bishop for eight years, uh, and uh, bishops uh, tend to move <laughs> more often than Methodist preachers move. But there's a lot to be said for new insights coming into a congregation, asking questions like, why do you do it this way? Are, are you getting the results you want? Or really, uh, you're concerned that you are you don't have children and youth. Huh, um, I, I wonder if uh, then we ought to let, should we try some new things and maybe we'd get different results? Those are the questions that a new person asks. So back to the thing, and uh, uh, I know as a bishop, I inherited a uh, mission statement for the conference. <clears throat> Every church challenged and equipped to make disciples of Jesus Christ by taking risk and changing lives. I, that was a mission statement they put on my desk when I arrived as bishop. And, and it was quite wonderful to um, go to, you know, to be in a cabinet meeting and a bishop tenant would say something like, well, Joe just doesn't think he's been affirmed by us as that he doesn't think he's received the promotions in churches that Joe thinks he should have received. It was wonderful to say, okay, um, let, let's look at our mission statement. I, I don't see any thing in our mission statement that says our job is to help pastors be more fulfilled in their ministries as they define fulfillment, uh, salary or whatever. Um, it says every church challenged and equipped. That's 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 what we do as a bishop and cabinet. Uh, so let let's let's stay focused now. It is is Joe. Is there something about his leadership of mission uh, that that we could help undergird through our appointed processes? Well, so in the book, I hit pretty hard the fact that every congregation ought to wrestle with a statement of mission and that it ought to hold itself accountable to that statement and focus on that rather than many of the things which are distractions. By the way, Alan, I really appreciate that you want to have a discussion about mission because it's my contention that the uh, conversation about separation 
uh, leaving, staying, I consider that a huge distraction from mission and often an indication that mission is no longer uh, that which driving us. And you can be sure that when a church becomes consumed with internal uh, questions, such as uh, who can be ordained and who shouldn't be ordained, uh, uh, what are what are your what are your commitments on this social issue as as opposed to other commitments and all? Uh, <clears throat> when you have conversations like that, it's a sure sign mission has taken a back seat to exclusively internal concerns. That is the way to death. Uh, I must say too, if you got a church with a median age of 62 years old, I'm, I'm thinking of a number of churches right now like that. Uh, uh, if, if that church is talking about separation, uh, leaving, staying, if, if that's the conversation, those are people avoiding tough conversations uh, that that are more important than some of the conversations we're having. Yeah, I was really disappointed. I have to say uh, there was before the last general conference and our delegates uh, went around the conference to have listening sessions, which I appreciated that they wanted to listen to people before the, you know, now our church hosted one and <laughs> What frustrated me was it really was, I mean, I was kind of hoping we'd have some good conversation. Instead, it was just pe people standing up, presenting their views, and then sitting down. I mean, it was just like, yeah, you know, there was really no serious conversation. And I think it's yeah. I think it's in serious, con serious con conversation where you do begin to make uh, make some headway. Let me let me because you mentioned the global Methodist Church and leaving. Um, and and um one of, so let me tell you a little story to kind of illustrate my question here, and that is, is that at our East Ohio Conference uh, 2019, this was uh, the last conference before the pandemic, uh, beautiful Lakeside, Ohio, I'm sitting across the table having coffee with a younger pastor, probably in his 30s, and he's a, he's a traditionalist on human sexuality, and he was very frustrated because he said, and he told me this story, he said that there were people in, in uh, at the conference wearing T-shirts that basically quoted from one of our uh, membership vows to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And it was in rainbow letters. So, so the message was clear. And he said, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm talking to this one person, a pastor friend of mine who has this shirt on, and yet she's trying to convince mm -hmm. me that there's room for me too here. And she says, so he says in, with her in one message, she's calling me an oppressor, but she's also saying there's room for you to be here. Uh, yeah. I, how do we, you know, there, there's, there's <laughs> hard a, to do that. There's a think. dissonance there. And, and I'm not, I am not sure how to solve that. Uh, well, I, I wonder if the way to solve that is by <clears throat> getting, uh, uh, better focused, refocused on mission. Uh, and in the book, I do some chastisement of fellow Methodists that have made uh, caucus, their cherished caucus, more important than their church, or their caucus has become their church. Uh, I have I worry when uh, my causes, uh, you know, for instance, I, <clears throat> I'd like to think that I have spent much of my ministry deeply concerned about race and issues of race. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from South Carolina. This was an important part of my own spiritual development, coming to terms with that. And I have, you know, However, the way we come to terms with any issue like race is called church. It's church is the means God has given us to <clears throat> be born again, to, to uh, refocus ourselves, to grow closer to Christ, to grow in our understanding of the parameters of Christian discipleship and the responsibilities. Uh, it's not by... Uh, 
emblazoning ourselves with a, a, a cause and saying, this, this is my test uh, for the faith, uh, uh, for your faith. It, it's my job to constantly confront and test you. Uh, I, I know one of the uh, surprises I've had with a book's publication, <clears throat> I sort of expected to get hammered by traditionalists or those who are talking about the Global Methodist Church, because I I do a, a kind of critique of uh, the Global Methodist Church. I, I hope fair and and all, but <clears throat> the surprise was when the book came out, I, I, I've really been critiqued more by so-called self label progressives who've said, and it's troubling to me what some of them have said to me, and that is, let them go, get them out of here. We'll, we'll be a better church once they're gone. I'm tired of hearing that. And I said, by the way, that's exactly what I've heard from a lot of traditionalists about you. And I think you're both wrong. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no Christian, is in a position to say to a fellow Christian, I'd be happier in my church if you'd leave. Uh, go. Let me help you go. Uh, no. Uh, the church is convened by Jesus Christ, and he is put in it whom he wants to be in it. And <clears throat> it's my job to, to see how can these sisters and brothers help me grow in my faith. Uh, so uh, I think it's easier to show up with a t-shirt with a slogan on it than it is to say, how can we be the body of Christ together? Uh, how can I be in conversation with you? Uh, ironic is many of the people who label themselves as progressives, uh, uh, <laughs> they were traditionalists 10 years ago, but somehow the Holy Spirit, uh, a good friend, a, a family, yeah, got mixed all up in that, and, and suddenly they have a new position. Well, for you to be condemning somebody else who's holding a position that you held, just to, so it, anyway, uh, mission is, I think, one way to uh, get out of our, uh, this, uh, and, and I know, I've heard from a lot of traditionalists, uh, the Methodist church progressives have allowed the culture to capture them, the culture to determine their values on things. And I said, you're absolutely right. We have. <laughs> uh, however, uh, be honest now, there's no way in the world you would be fighting over issues related to same-sex love, there'd be no way that you'd say, this is the acid test for whether I stay or go. What, what are we doing about that one issue? There's no way you would do that in any other cultural moment except the present one. That, that agenda has not been given you by scripture. It's not been given to you by the history of Wesleyanism. It's been given to you by the culture. Uh, so, um, you know, who's culturally corrupted now? <laughs> you know, yeah, we well, all are in different ways. Yeah, yeah cultural condition. I mean, I, I was, we're always selective um, in that because, uh, you know, you can talk about uh, where progressives have given into culture, but let's on the other side talk about militarism <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, materialism yeah. and not necessarily fully embracing a health and wealth, well, health yeah. and wealth gospel, but getting kind of close to it. So, so whenever I hear you're you're mm -hmm. being you're you're letting the culture determine your values, I say, who isn't there? Who who? Yeah. We, we all have that problem. And in fact, it, that's one reason I I would be I'm sad if a traditionalist would would leave my congregation. I'd be sad because maybe God has sent that traditionalist to me <laughs> to help me see better my own blinders my the own way the ways i've been corrupted uh by the culture uh i know uh and maybe i'm i'm there to when i'm in conversation with someone and they say well you know i'm on 
on issues of sexual uh, orientation and all, I'm I'm a biblical, I'm a traditionalist. I believe the Bible says what it says. And I said, really, I, I, I find that hard to do myself because I know people who are divorced and, um, and remarried, even though our Lord clearly condemns that. And there's no way around his condemnation of that. Uh, you can hear Matthew, Paul struggling with the fact that this is what our Lord said, clearly. Uh, but but uh, so you 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 condemn divorce and you condemn marriage after divorce. Do you exclude them from your church or what? And he said, No, 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 no. And I said, Oh, um, so you're a biblical traditionalist, uh, uh, but but you have a list of certain things that you are anyway. It, it, it those conversations i wouldn't want to lose those conversations and those conversation partners because i've learned i've got a united methodist pastor friend who's african american and he's finds himself deeply troubled that our church can split over issues of sexual orientation but that our church tolerated and tolerates racism uh, in in the church and in our practices. And, uh, it, you know, it, and he says, it, it's just curious to me that people are suddenly all worked up over the fact that there are people who may be practicing injustice related to sexual orientation, but are not that worked up that there is racialized practice and thinking in our church. I think that's an interesting point. I think yeah. that's that's a painful point. Yeah. Which is why, and, and I agree with you, scripture is best read and interpreted in community and 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 not just community where we all think the same. We've got to have people. I got I, I need people around the table who don't see things the way I do in order to understand. It's hard. It's hard for us to do that. We we do want to be confirmed, don't we? Yeah, it, I think that's natural. What's not natural <laughs> is to believe Jesus Christ is Lord and that he does not tolerate any competitors <laughs> mm -hmm. to his lordship. Um, he, he's often nice about it, <laughs> but he still keeps working with us and on us to more fully love him and his way and to explore the joy of, of being different. <laughs> and maybe Methodists have expended so much theological energies to kind of blend in, to say, well, we're middle of the road. We're not too much this way. We're not too much that way. Maybe now we need a, a refurbishment <clears throat> of our sense that to be a Wesleyan is to be somebody who believes God is busy in the world in mission. And therefore, our big questions are not uh, what is your sexual orientation or how do you stand on this particular social issue? Uh, our big thing is uh, where is Jesus Christ active and how can we join with him in what he's up to in the world? That's the issue. So, and all the other issues come along behind it. Uh, so. Okay. Um, we've got about five minutes left. I want to be mindful here of your time. Um, but I do want to ask the question. So you, by the way, uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, as, as you do, Bishop, in all of your books, you, you, you are, I, some, I, I refer to your writing sometimes as you're an equal opportunity annoyer. And that is that. Well, and thank that you. What a sweet you're thing welcome. To say. That that you you go after progressives. You also go after mm -hmm. uh, uh, conser traditionalists. You 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 are you spread your criticism around. So I, I would encourage everyone to read this book. Um, I would like to at some point have conversation about uh, these terms, progressive and liberal, conservative, and all that, because you, oh, you point out in your book I that those become more stand, determinative. I can't and stand that, either term, and uh, think yep. they're both unbiblical but i am i am ahead. not yeah i'm not into that either but but what i want to get to is in some of your questions you ask the global methodist church one of them is, is interesting as you say 
Do you really think the answer to a, a failing denomination is another denomination is basically what you say, because everything we see, it looks like denominations, at least for the time being, are on the outs. Um, so let me turn that question back. Uh, by the way, I have a friend. He's not a Methodist. He refers to he refers to the, the denominational structure as what he likes to call the FDRing of the church that. Uh, you know, because all of this rose at the time when you very know, insightful. Yeah, you're in, you're increasing predominant. What are we salvaging then? If denominationalism, we you you rightly asked that question of the global Methodist Church. Well, what about us? What what are we? We we we've got the system. But what are we salvaging? Yeah, I I re, uh, yeah I I don't think uh, yeah the questions that interest me now are. Uh, I don't think the United Methodist Church can continue. It it won't continue. I look at numbers, et cetera, and and all in its present form. But my, we don't want it to continue in that present form. The United Methodist Church, as I received it <clears throat> as a pastor and all, uh, was basically, I'd say, uh, a creation more of the 1960s and 50s. Uh, heavily legalistic, rule-driven. Uh, why can't we see the present moment as a grand opportunity to reinvent, to recover, to re-envision? Uh, some examples. Uh, ordination of clergy was always an annual conference uh, activity. And yet, beginning in the 1950s and proceeding aggressively through the 1960s, Ordination became a general conference, general church prerogative with uh, the, like the paragraphs on ministry <laughs> increased by two thirds over a 25 year period with rules and all. I think all of those should be stricken and the church should again say to the annual conference, <clears throat> it's your job to find out uh, which clergy God wants to lead ministry in your annual conference uh, done. Uh, I think a lot of the debates we're in now are aggravated by that kind of top-down uh, administration. And all. So that, that's that's one area um, that, and to regain a sense of, of uh, the local church being the, ba the basic unit of ministry, the Book of Discipline says that, and then goes on to churn out paragraphs of rules and regulations for how local churches have to do their work and organize themselves. Uh, and by the way, in the present moment, I mean, what do you do when you have a general conference and they take a vote, um, <clears throat> like on who can be ordained and not ordained? And then immediately across the church, there's a big backlash of clergy and churches saying, we, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we will not abide by this general conference vote. And I was present at four different annual conferences where they threw out everybody who voted, <laughs> who voted that way and, and put in a whole new, it, to get back. I, I want to say to both all sides, it, the, these issues can't be solved by voting. General Conference cannot resolve issues that are in play and in action. Um, stop trying to vote a General Conference to force every Methodist church to look like General Conference uh, votes. Uh, in the, Every local church should be empowered to say, you get to define what God wants to do in your mission. And by the way, if you don't, you'll die. Yeah. Your God will take you out because, you know, we don't need any more sanctified rotary clubs or uh, women's garden club or whatever. Uh, we need the body of Christ in motion. That's what Methodists do. And so I, I'm excited about and interested when people talk about uh, uh, options. For instance, a bishop was telling me that really trying on their cabinet to say to churches, uh, if you feel the need to, we will allow you to uh, determine 
are you a traditionalist United Methodist Church or are you a progressive United Methodist Church? We don't, uh, you, and we promise to take that into account as we're appointing clergy because we have clergy who need to label themselves that way too. <laughs> and we'll try to put that into the match. And in a way, that's what good cabinets and bishops have always done. But they're trying, what they're trying to do is to give us more adaptability and flexibility. And I think, so this, as we move into the, the future, this, this could be a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to say, how can we be a more faithful church? Well, let me end with a, a comment and a question to see how what you think about this, because we, we would, how we can be more faithful and doing maybe uh, I, I won't say uh, cre new ways, but but creative ways of doing ministry that, that have happened in the past and places and are happening now. I've wondered what would happen if our annual conferences, if we started to if we developed and encouraged. Uh, when I real quick, when I go to Cuba, I, I go to Cuba. I've gone there for almost twenty years to teach Methodist wow. pastors at this at the seminary in Havana. Wonderful. When a, when a young pastor and the, the Cuban Methodist Church, by the way, the average age is in their twenties. Okay, so they're young. Wow. And the church. And um, when when a when someone comes to a, a pastor and says, "I think God's calling to ministry, calling me to ministry," the pastor puts the uh, uh, this per this person in, gives them to the superintendent and the superintendent says, all right, you go out, start a house church. And when you get 15 people, give me a call. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. And, and so, so, and, and by the way, they don't send you to seminary uh, because the denomination bears the, the cost because these Cubans can't afford it. And we're not going to invest in you unless we, unless we've already got some evidence that you're an effective pastor. I mean, it's just so backward from what we do. What would happen? That's wonderful. Yeah. What would happen if we, uh, if we mm. started to invest in our own little house church movement? I, I uh, that is happening uh, already, but in, in a very small scale, but I think uh, I love this image of a North American <laughs> going to Cuba and saying, hi, you, you seem to be succeeding where we're not. We, we've somehow created a church where 20 year olds feel very uncomfortable and bored and uninterested. Uh, help us, yeah. please. And they said, well, here's, here's what you can do. Uh, this notion of, uh, I love that image of, uh, let uh, why don't you go out and start a church and let, let's see if God uses you or not and maybe a year you'll come back and say hey I'm really not called to be a pastor I'm called to be an accountant uh, thank you for helping me figure that out uh, on the other hand I remember the young man uh, in my office <laughs> I, I made, gave him his license to preach he had started a church for 20 somethings with addictions and his daddy was a Methodist preacher. This guy had real trouble getting his college degree. One reason he had trouble doing that is he was so busy starting a congregation there. Well, I gave him his license to preach in my office <laughs> and said, go do create a new Methodist church. Come on. And, um, he eventually went back to college, got his degree. He was eventually ordained and all. But uh, that's the Wesleyan spirit. And uh, to get back to that, sadly, we've become ossified when, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm now participating in jurisdictional conference and uh, we're busy electing bishops. And I notice all the questions being asked of prospective candidates for bishop are, what is your stand on this? How do you believe about uh, uh, this uh, internal issue, uh, et cetera? Nobody's asking, uh, what, what's something you've started in a Methodist church? Uh, do you know how to start? Do you know Because we need some things started. <laughs> we need some things discarded, and we need some things begun. Uh, are you good at that? Uh, do you know how to lead that? You know, 
mission questions or, or a, a question, uh, how many new Christians have you made uh, during your ministry? Uh, how many, uh, you know, professions of faith were you, did you produce? Uh, I think I already know the answer to that on, on most cases, uh, very few. But uh, so I love your emphasis on mission. And I love uh, those trips to Cuba where you get to see the body of Christ in motion in ways that that really challenge our rather sedate, located vision of church. Yeah. yeah, the one thing I've never taught there at the seminary is evangelism because I figured they have more to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> a, good, a, a good call. Good I, don't call think, I don't think that I have anything to say here on this. Well, listen, uh, Bishop, we're at time. I want to thank you again uh, for your time. I know you're busy in the midst of the, the jurisdictional conference. Friends, this is the book, Will Williman, Don't Look Back. I highly recommend it to your reading, Methodist Pastors mm -hmm. and Laity. Please take a look at this book, uh, Methodist Hope for What Comes Next. And the one thing you do say, you remind us in the book about the resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, uh, God isn't going to bury uh, we uh, tend to want to bury. God manages to find uh, new life, uh, even in the midst of our self, uh, self-designated cemeteries. <laughs> anyway, Bishop, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank appreciate you, it. Yep. And for me with you. You, you, you as well. This is, uh, I'm Alan Bevere and this is, uh, Faith Seeking Understanding and the patron saint of Faith Seeking Understanding is Anselm of Canterbury who said, I do not understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. Friends, keep seeking. Mm -hmm.